Hey there, I'm Dave Lemieux, creator of Blue Gospel Scripts. Welcome to King Saul, The Meltdown, an important piece of biblical history, though easy to overlook because it's a hard subject. And with these things, it's good to be in the know. So here you go. We don't want to know, we don't want to know, how will we ever learn what we don't want to know? We don't want to know, we don't want to know, how will we ever learn what we don't want to know? Stick a shovel in the ground, take the time to sift the dirt. Trust the process if it's sound. Dig on in and do the work. What is buried in the sand might could prove the story true. Don't dismiss it out of hand. Just to cradle your
The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. Where'd the weeds come from? asked the field owner's servants. An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked, do you want us to pull up the weeds? No, replied the owner. The disciples asked Jesus to explain the parable, and he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. Hmm. So the devil's got people. <laughs> son of man's got people. Devil's got people. That's uh, quite a thing. Yes. Still wondering why we all just can't get along. Which people do we suspect were drowned in the Great Flood? And why wasn't that a once and for all kind of event? Mm -hmm. Clean slate. I mean, at least for a few generations. Nope. Not long after Noah and family exited the ark, he cursed a grandson, Canaan, and another of Ham's sons, Cush became the father of a guy who seems to better fit the description of the giant Nephilim than a normal man. Both Genesis and First Chronicles list Cush's sons in a strange way. Chronicle. Hmm. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havila, Sabta, Rama, and Sabteca. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on earth. Now notice Nimrod has his own sentence. The Greek Septuagint renders mighty as it relates to Nimrod, as gigas kunigos, which means dog-leading giant. Guzik cites a Jewish targum, which says Nimrod began to be bold in sin, murderer of the innocent and a rebel before the Lord. According to Josephus, Nimrod said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for he'd build a tower too high for the waters to reach. And he'd avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers, which I think is interesting, because Nimrod is identifying himself with those whom God destroyed, right. even though he is descended from Noah, whom God saved, which is confusing. And we're just gonna leave it there for now and, and jump over to another of Noah's sons, Shem, whose line included a bear and ultimately Abram and the Hebrews. Chronicle. Eber had two sons. One was named Peleg, division in Hebrew, because in his time, also the time of his cousin Nimrod, the earth was divided. So, Shem, Arpachshad, Shalach, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Serug, Nahor, Terah, and Abram, which is Abraham. Okay, now Abraham's descendants are, of course, well documented throughout Scripture and all of our scripts, but for a moment, Let's focus on one of Abraham's great-great-grandsons, Benjamin, the youngest son of Israel, the apple of Jacob's eye. In the end of the book of Judges, all Israel bitterly battled the tribe of Benjamin to the brink of its extinction. Why? I mean, besides God telling them to do that, why? Well, what you're about to hear is appalling but we can't proceed without explaining what happened in, to, and through the tribe of Benjamin. In the days when Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit, wicked Benjamites in Gibeah terrorized a traveling priest. They gang-raped and murdered his concubine. Now these Benjamites were called sons of Belial, which is similar to saying sons of evil or sons of Satan. Mm. So the devil's got people. Right. Mm. Gebeah, besides being the home of the Benjamites, was also the home of the Hivites. Many scholars believe there were giants among the Hivites. So it isn't a stretch at all to assume that over time, perhaps through intermarriage with Hivites, Benjamites fell victim to whatever evil produced the Nephilim before the flood and Nimrod after the flood. When priests confronted the rest of the Benjamites in Gibeah about the sons of Belial all living among them, they refused to turn them over to the authorities. 
So God sanctioned a civil war of sorts against the whole tribe of Benjamin, which should have wiped it out. Except 600 Benjamite men, all valiant fighters like the heroes of old, ran away. Hmm, that's no problem though, right? Just pursue them. Finish them off like God said, right? Well, uh, not only did Israel let the last 600 Benjamites live, they decided, uh, without consulting the Lord, to provide wives for them. 200 of these wives came from the annual festival at Shiloh. Benjamites were instructed to steal young, unsuspecting virgins from multiple tribes who were there minding their own business, dancing before the Lord. It's, it's grotesque. Mm -hmm. And now, Benjamitis was an epidemic spreading from tribe to tribe. And how does that differ from Genesis 6? The angels saw the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. It's too similar to dismiss. Angels taking human women and corrupting humanity. A wicked tribe in Israel taking virgins from other tribes and corrupting all Israel. Benjamites were supposed to be wiped out, not assisted in perpetuating their wickedness. This is important context for the introduction of the most famous Benjamite of all, Israel's first king, Saul of Gebeah in Benjamin, about whom Samuel said he was a head taller than anyone else in Israel. King Saul was tall, now why do we think that is? Why bother to point it out, if it were none of our business? The tribe of Benjamin was scheduled to be dispatched, but Israel playing God apparently grew too attached. How blind, how blunt, how juvenile and confused. We drop our defenses at battlefront, no wonder we stand accused. How prideful are we, that we would replace the Lord. Unhappy in our theocracy, we fall on a monarch's sword. The heroes of old. If legend can be believed Of sons of God and daughters of men Uniquely conceived The truth is rich As thick as a hearty stew As salty as angels bedeviled with pride Like ego from guardians too hmm. How marvelous, how mad The fallen who forced the pace like Jude, the brother of Jesus, said, abandon their proper place. How tempting are we that angels were overwhelmed, unhappy in their theocracy, they fell to a lower realm. King Saul was told. So, I was Israel's last judge before her first king. I might have never been born if not for the persistent prayers of my mother, Hannah. She had my name, Samuel, in mind instantly, a name meaning heard by God. As Soon as I was weaned, she dedicated me to the Lord and brought me to serve in Shiloh, where I grew up and eventually became Eli the priest's apprentice. Mom visited me every year during the time of sacrifice and for her faithfulness, 
God rewarded her with three more sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, Eli, the priest's sons, were extorting meat from any Israelite bringing offerings to Shiloh. Mm. By the time Eli finally called them on it, and on their sleeping with women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting, it was already too late, and his sons didn't listen or repent. So now we have priests violating women. Now in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. Not many visions, so I, I wasn't expecting or used to hearing God's voice. And one night while I was lying near the ark, the Lord called to me three times. But I thought maybe it was Eli, my mentor, who was old and nearly blind. Eli eventually realized it was God calling to me, so he told me to answer. Speak, I finally responded, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord told me Eli's family would be judged forever because of unchecked sinful acts. Wow. The sons blasphemed God, and Eli failed to restrain them, God said. Oh, I had to work up my courage to relay this message to Eli, my, my mentor. He took it about, well, as well as someone could. <laughs> the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and his prophetic record was flawless. All of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized him as a prophet of the Lord. Now, sometime later, the Israelites and the Philistines battled. Israel lost about 4,000 men. And so they called for the Ark of the Covenant to be brought to camp thinking, see, now God would have to save them. And as the Ark entered the camp, they raised an earth-shaking shout. The Philistines were like, what's all that shouting? We better go check it out. They fought again. Israel lost again. And this time, the losses were much worse. The Philistines killed 30,000 men, including Eli's blaspheming sons, and they captured the ark. Now, a runner reported the news to Eli, the loss of his sons, both on the same day as prophesied, the loss of the ark. Now, at this, Eli fell back in his chair, and he broke his 98-year-old neck, ending 40 years of service as Israel's priest. One of Eli's daughters-in-law, while pregnant, heard the grim news, and unable to bear it, she died after giving birth and carefully naming her son Ichabod, meaning no glory. The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. But it wouldn't stay gone for long. Now after the Philistine strongholds of Eshdod and Gath played host to the ark and their inhabitants experienced an outbreak of tumors, well, they tried to move it to Ekron, but Ekron citizen said, Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> Hello, tumors. <laughs> now, had Eli or his daughter-in-law been able to hold out just seven short months, they would have lived to see a miracle. Mm. The Philistines hand-delivering the ark, along with a, I'm sorry, offering <laughs> back to Israel. Well, actually, it was, it was more hoof-delivered. Than That's delivered. true. <laughs> they sent it on a cart towed by two cows while they watched from a safe distance until it reached the Levites in Beth Shemesh. The cows, on their own, with no driver, traveled straight, not stopping for grass or, or veering off course. That was the miracle. And only the Philistines witnessed it. God was making himself known among the Philistines. Keep this in mind when we meet the Philistine later in this script. Notice here how it wasn't just the Philistines who needed to learn the fear of the Lord. Right. Seventy Hebrew inhabitants of Bet Shemesh died after just looking into the ark, causing the rest of Israel to question, Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? Then they sent messengers up the hill to a neighboring town closer to Jerusalem. And here was the message. The Philistines brought the ark back. Yay! Come up and take it to your town! <laughs> Men came down the hill, collected the ark, and brought it up to Avinadov's house on a hill. And they consecrated his son to guard it. It remained there 20 years while the Israelites turned back to the Lord, confessing their sinful ways.
we can touch We want him to see but not notice much We want him to speak but not dress us down We pray his protection, object to inspection While the Ark was resting comfortably in Avinadav's house, Samuel began serving as Israel's leader under difficult circumstances. So the Philistines attacked Israel at Mitzpah in Moab. And the people had asked me to pray. God answered my prayer by sending loud thunder, throwing the Philistines into a panic until they were routed. So he subdued the Philistines and they stopped invading Israel's territory. Now this should be the last mention of the Philistines. Should be. <laughs> when Samuel was elderly, his two sons blew it. And because of this wickedness, Israel's elders decided it was time for Israel to have a king like all the other nations had. No more of this God will lead us nonsense. In fact, God straight up told me, it's not you they've rejected as their leader, it's me. So I relayed the following message from God. The king you ask for will take your sons and make them run in front of his chariots, and others will plow his ground, and others will make weapons of war. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks. He'll take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your groves, and he'll give them to his attendants. Your servants will serve him. You yourselves will become slaves. Their king will take from them. This should remind us of the surviving Benjamites at the end of Judges who took wives from all the other tribes at Shiloh, or the angels who took wives. So, Saul, the Benjamite, was out looking for his father's lost donkeys. Now, God had already revealed to me that Saul was coming and that he would be Israel's first king, and that he would deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines, which was odd to me because I thought I had already done that. <laughs> But I greeted Saul and had him stay a while. I asked him a rhetorical question. And to whom is the desire of all Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? Saul, like most of us, the first hearing of this question, he didn't really understand its weight. 
Saul's family line of Benjamites was corrupt. And now Samuel said, all Israel desired to be led down the same path. After dinner, I anointed Saul. Shortly thereafter, I called Israel all together at Mitzvah and had them present themselves tribe by tribe so God might choose a king by lot. God chose Benjamin's tribe, then Matri's clan, then Saul, but he hid himself among the supplies. <laughs> Saul preferred the shadows. the shadows, but I brought him out into the light and I set him apart to be consecrated. Long, Long live, live the king! king! Everyone shouted. Before sending everyone home, I wrote the rights and duties of kingship on a scroll. After explaining to the people what they'd gotten themselves into, I deposited the scroll before the Lord. But the sons of Bileal said, How can this fellow save us? And they despised him, and they paid him no tribute. <laughs> Wait, did Samuel just say the sons of Bileal were at the coronation at Mitzpah? He did. Like the guys who gang raped the Levite's concubine, which is what made God want to wipe out all of Benjamin? The same. And they knew Saul enough to know he was no savior? Basically. And they hated him, and they wouldn't pay taxes. Sort of. They sound like they're talking about a traitor to their cause. But let's see where Saul's loyalty truly lies. Spoiler alert, he wasn't switching sides. He was still very much a Benjamite. God put this on display for us early in Saul's tenure when Nahash, the Ammonite, went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead, an Israelite town east of the Jordan. Jabesh Gilead is where the other 400 wives came from for the surviving Benjamites who were supposed to be wiped out at the end of Judges. So now as Nahash the Ammonite besieged Jabesh Gilead, it was a town full of half Benjamite offspring. Make a treaty with us and we'll be subject to you, these half Benjamites said to the Ammonite king. But Nahash replied, I'll make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and so bring disgrace on all Israel. You know, Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. Right, and wasn't that what Israel was supposed to do? Lose one of their members, one of their tribes, in order to save the rest. They couldn't bring themselves to gouge out the tribe of Benjamin completely from Israel, even though even though the original Benjamin, youngest son of Jacob, the one Jacob called son of my right hand, or substitute right eye, or apple of my eye, if you'd like, his own father Jacob pronounced this prophetic blessing on him before he died. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey. In the evening, he divides the he plunder. He divides the plunder. Now imagine the raped concubine in Gebeah as the prey and the virgins at Shiloh as the plunder. And you'll have a sense of why gouging out Benjamin, as painful as that would have been, could have spared all Israel from experiencing hell on earth. One of Saul's first acts as king was to spare the right eyes of the half Benjamite men of Jabesh by threatening all Israel into war against Ahash and the Ammonites. After slaughtering and scattering the Ammonites, the people then said to me, who are those sons of Belial that wouldn't bow to Saul? Turn them over to us so we may put them to death. But Saul said, no one will be put to death today, for this day the Lord has rescued Israel. The Lord noted. Saul invoked the Lord's name while rescuing a wicked tribe and sparing sons of Belial. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, only the one who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name drive out demons, perform many miracles, and I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you.
thistles? No, Lord. Can you pick figs from thistles? No, Lord. A thistle doesn't tickle, and neither shall the sickle. Can you pick figs from thistles? No, Lord. Not everyone who cries. So after the slaughter of the Ammonites, I brought all the people to Gilgal, the site of Israel's first permanent encampment in the Promised Land. There, all the people made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. And Saul and all of the Israelites, they held a great celebration. I didn't really join them in spirit. Instead, I asked them if they'd ever considered me, their leader before Saul, a taker. Whose ox or donkey have I taken? I mean, whom have I cheated or oppressed? You haven't taken anything from anyone. The Lord is witness against you, and so is Saul, that you've not found anything in my hand or up my sleeve. But now here's the king you have chosen, the one you have asked for. The Lord has set him over you. Still, if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and don't rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord, then good. But if you don't obey the Lord, his hand will be against you, as it was against your ancestors. Now then, open your eyes and watch this. I, your prophet, will call on the Lord your God to send thunder and rain, and you'll realize what an evil thing you did in the eyes of the Lord when you asked for a king. Not long after this, Saul made reckless war with a people already in submission to Samuel. He had his son Jonathan attack a Philistine outpost in order to stir them up against Israel. Saul summoned the people to join him at Gilgal. When the Israelites saw their situation was critical and their army was hard pressed, they hid and some even crossed the Jordan to get away. I tried to stop Saul. I told him to wait in Gilgal seven days for me. I delayed my coming until the last moment. 
This caused the troops in Gilgal to start to scatter, which would have been good. I mean, this was an unsanctioned war. Saul didn't think so. Desperate, he started to mimic obedience to God by offering up sacrifices, hoping this would encourage his troops to stick with him. When I finally arrived, he came out to greet me. And I said, what have you done? You are a fool. You haven't kept the command the Lord gave you. I just told you, fear the Lord. Serve him faithfully with all your heart. Had you done this, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler. And with that, they left Gilgal and went up to Saul's hometown, Gibeah, in Benjamin. The Philistines were sending out raiding parties for Michmash. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had smartly said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel had to pay the Philistines to have their iron stuff sharpened. Therefore, on the day of the battle, only King Saul and his son Jonathan had swords. Yeah. It sounds an awful lot like Saul's intentions were to see Israel gouged out without a sword or spear to gouge back. Saul's son Jonathan may or may not have picked up on his father's insidiousness, but either way, he began to operate outside of Saul's oversight. So one day, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. The Philistines saw them coming and mocked them. Quickly, Jonathan killed 20 of them. Then the whole Philistine army began to scatter as the ground shook and God sent a terrible panic. Saul's lookouts in Gibeah saw the Philistine army melting away in all directions. So he ordered his 600 men to find out which soldier might have left the ranks. I see God sparing Israeli lives here, sending an earthquake to scatter the Philistines. I don't think Saul was interested in sparing Israeli lives outside of his own tribe. He seems to be upset the Philistines were scattering. And Saul and all of his men assembled and went to battle. They found the Philistines in total confusion, just striking each other with their swords. On the surface, this was a great victory for Saul and the Israelites. We should expect a celebration, right? But the Israelites were in distress that day because Saul had bound the people under oath saying, cursed be anyone who eats food before evening comes before I've avenged myself on my enemies. What a Nimrod. So no one ate, except Jonathan, who was then nearly killed by his father's hand until other soldiers spoke up for him. Do we really think Saul was gonna kill Jonathan because he ate some honey in the woods after fighting so valiantly? Or can we just read between the lines a little and assume Jonathan had now become the enemy shadowy Saul was referring to when he said he wanted to avenge himself. Now over time, Saul stirred up war with all of Israel's neighbors, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the king of Zobah, and the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment. He fought valiantly like the heroes of old as Israel's deliverer. Whenever Saul saw a mighty or a brave man, whether Hebrew or not, he took him into his service because he was a taker. Long live the king. One of us is shadows, one is sunshine. One's had the bad tobacco in the bloodline Corrupted from the gut up and the belt down Less than likely destined for a meltdown I surprised my quiet neighbors with a roundup Arranged an angel army from the ground up we're either gonna tear the gates of heaven down Or fade away to vapor in the meltdown If I'm the mayor 
a puppeteer Where my status and my stature in the stratosphere What kind of king would think he should have knelt down The kind who's got a mind about to melt down This is too similar to what came to be the nickname of the Nephilim in Genesis, the heroes of old. We can't be sure what Saul planned to do with this enhanced army, but Samuel spoke for God and God had his own plan. I'll punish the Amalekites, God said. I'll finally wipe them out for what they did to Israel after the Exodus, and I'll use Saul to do it. So Saul did attack the Amalekites, which looked like obedience. But he took their king, Agag, alive. He also spared the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was strong. These, he and his men, were unwilling to destroy completely, which God had instructed. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then God said to me, I regret making Saul king. Well, now consider this. The only other time God had regret, the root Hebrew word is more like a sigh. God wasn't really regretting like we would. Sure. The only time God went <sighs> was just before he flooded an earth full of evil perpetrated by the heroes of old. After this Amalekite business, Ooh, Saul took a downward turn and he spiraled quickly. We parted ways and I was pretty depressed. God asked me, how long will you mourn for Saul's downfall? I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be the king. David. Samuel anointed David, and from that day the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Meanwhile, a harmful spirit from God began tormenting Saul, who was stationed on the other side of the valley from Gath. Saul's only solace came through music, David's music. So Saul sent word to Jesse and took David into his service as a music therapist and armor bearer. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war. They sent a champion named Goliath, a giant from Gath who looked bronzed, a helmet, a coat of armor, blade coverings, javelin, all bronze. Handsome, but threatening. Uh, but let's just break it down. We call Goliath a champion, but the Targum, an ancient Aramaic translation of the original Hebrew, says Goliath was a man from between them, or as Adam Clark paraphrased, a middleman. That sounds a little less threatening, right? The implication is Goliath had either something in common with both sides or neither. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Which is like saying, we're, we're all being played here. Choose a man, one man, and have him come down to me, Goliath said. If he is able to kill me, we'll all become your subjects. But if I kill him, you'll become our subjects and serve us, Goliath shouted. This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. In the light of day, come out of the shadow, Saul. It seems Saul never had any intention of wiping out the Philistines. His agitating them served some other purpose. Otherwise, he would have gladly gone to war with them. Now, 
What threat was Goliath against all of Saul's mighty men? Whatever it was Saul wanted, it wasn't this guy following the rules of polite warfare, offering to fight one-on-one -on -one and keep the bloodshed to a minimum. Right. But Saul tried to bribe someone, I mean anyone, <laughs> to go shut this guy up. Right. David volunteered to fight Goliath, and Saul said, yeah, right, you'll lose and we'll all be Philistine subjects. But David was not going to take no for an answer. Victorious, he stood over the giant, took Goliath's own sword, and cut off his head. Saul watched all of this happen. He stood beside Abner, his army commander, and asked, whose son is that? Strange question given Saul had specifically sent word to Jesse back in the day before hiring David, Jesse's son, he knew whose son David was. So he was essentially asking, from what tribe is this kid? Is there a tribe still unaffected by Benjamitis? Going backwards, David, Jesse, Obed, Boaz, Salmon, Nashon, Aminadav, Ram, Hezron, Perez, Tamar, and Judah. So consider this. David's tribe, the tribe of Judah, will be forever linked with the tribe of Benjamin. The other ten tribes, the northern tribes, in fact, are generally considered to be lost to history, dating all the way back to the Assyrian exile in about 740 BC. The two southern tribes unaffected by the Assyrian exile were Judah and Benjamin. Therefore, modern Jews consider themselves to be descendants of Judah, Benjamin, or a mixture of both. And this reminder from Jewish voice is going to blow your mind. Back in the days of Joseph, when the families of Israel suffered a great famine, Judah promised his father he'd protect Benjamin on the journey to Egypt for grain. And when Joseph threatened to keep Benjamin as a slave for stealing the planted silver cup, Judah pleaded to be held instead so the youngest brother, Benjamin, could return to the father. So Judah's sole purpose, once upon a time, was to save Benjamin. And make no mistake, the tribe of Benjamin needed saving. Whether or not they deserved it is another question. Remember, they were infiltrated by savage sons of Belial, first on horrific display here. Down Tel sundown in Israel. We're in Gibeah, and this is right about where the sun started to go down on Israel as a nation. Again, a quick summary of the last three chapters of Judges. The tribe of Benjamin went bad. God told the rest of Israel to wipe them out. The rest of Israel refused. So by the time of the prophet Samuel, Benjamin was alive and well. Benjamitis was spreading. And Israel's first king, King Saul of Gibeah, was, unbeknownst to most, an enemy of the state. And by the way, Judah's saving Benjamin takes on a dynamic new dimension when we jump ahead to Jesus' knocking New Testament Saul off his donkey and calling him to a whole new life as Paul, the apostle. But we're not there yet. We're still here in Gibeah with Old Testament Saul. And he's about to use his own daughter in an attempt to corrupt the tribe of Judah. Now Saul, hell-bent on seeing little half-Benjamite grandbabies running around his house, enticed David to marry Michal by appealing to his warrior protector side. Saul said he'd trade Michal for 200 Philistine foreskins. Yeah. Then Saul sent David right back to war against the Philistines, hoping he'd die. He didn't. The Philistines ran off. They were more afraid of David than Saul was. So, a little later, Saul sent men to David's house at night to kill him. But Michal warned him, and then she helped him escape. Notice how. She laid an idol on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. So when Saul sent the men to capture David, Michal said, he's ill, see? What was Michal, daughter of Israel's king, doing with an idol in the house, one large enough to be mistaken for a man. Right. Way back when Rachel, the mother of Benjamin, stole idols from her father Laban, they were small. 
easy to conceal in a bag. But now in Saul's household, this gross violation of the first commandment seems to be no secret at all. David escaped Jerusalem and came to Ramah to see me. He told me everything, all this that we've been talking about. When Saul found out David had come, he sent men to capture him. Now, I had no army to stop Saul's men, but I had the Spirit of God and a bunch of student prophets. <laughs> we started singing songs under the influence of the Spirit of God, and then something amazing happened. The Spirit of God came upon Saul's men, and they joined us. Saul sent more men, and, and they joined us too. <laughs> then he sent even more men, and, and they joined us. Finally, Saul himself set out from Jerusalem, heading our way. And before he got there, the Spirit of God came on him too, but in a unique way. He began doing what we were doing while he was walking towards us. But when he finally arrived, he stripped off all of his clothes and he lay there naked all day and night. The people of Ramah, well, they weren't buying it. Is Saul also a prophet? They asked sarcastically. At any rate, this whole episode gave David a chance to flee. Yeah, he went to see Jonathan and over the next several days was able to convince Jonathan that Saul meant to kill him. And Saul tried to kill Jonathan too for helping David. David eventually went to Nob, the town of the priests, and he made a beeline for the tabernacle, looking for help from the priest. But when he went inside, the priest was trembling. Strange, except it might be explained by Saul's chief shepherd Doeg's being there. He was another mighty man, a non-Hebrew recruit from Edom. David recognized him and figured he was spying for Saul. That day, David, after learning Saul had spies all over Israel, fled to Ahish, king of guess where? Gath, Goliath's hometown. <laughs> okay. David was afraid of him, of course, but figured, get this, that he was the lesser of two evils. David pretended to be insane. The king said to his servants, look at that man. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you brought this guy into my house? <laughs> David left Gath and found a suitable hiding place in the cave of Adullam. Some Gadites defected to David while he was in the cave. Men from Gad likely descended from the 400 virgins from Jabesh Gilead who kept the tribe of Benjamin from extinction, and they were not like normal men. Huh. They were more like the heroes of old, warriors with the faces of lions, and they were swift as gazelles. The least of these men was a match for a hundred and the greatest for a thousand. They crossed the Jordan in the first month when it was overflowing all its banks, meaning they were tall. It was a prophet of Gad, the prophet Gad, who told David to leave the cave of Adullam and head toward Judah. So David left and he went to the forest of Heret. Meanwhile, Saul was at home in Gibeah with all of his officials. He said to them, listen, men of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make all y'all commanders? Is that why you've all conspired against me? But Doeg, the Edomite, who was standing with Saul's officials said, I saw the son of Jesse come to the priest of Nob. Then Saul sent for the priest and all the men of his family who were the priests at Nob, and they all came to the king, 85 priests. Saul commanded his officials to kill them all. They wouldn't do it. So he commanded Doeg to do it. Not only did Doe kill all the priests, except for Eviatau, who escaped, he went to Nob and killed all the rest of the men, women, children, infants, cattle, donkeys, and sheep. Consider this. Young David thought he knew all about good and evil, looking across the valley of Elach at Goliath. But now he'd seen the senseless slaughter Saul had ordered and realized that the shadowy spirit of the heroes of old is not so much like Goliath, who actually followed standard combat procedure when he offered to fight one-on-one -on -one in order to spare the lives of many people. The real evil, like Doeg, pretends to worship at the tabernacle and then kills all the priests. So David wrote Psalm 52, a lyric about Doeg. Why do you boast of evil, you mighty hero? You're a disgrace in the eyes of God, you who practice deceit. 
Your tongue plots destruction. It's like a sharpened razor. You love evil rather than good, lies rather than truth. <laughs> the devil's got people. Surely God will bring you down to everlasting ruin. The righteous will see and laugh. But I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. Sheep, sheep, don't you know the road? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Sheep, sheep, don't you know the road? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Sheep, sheep, don't you know the road? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Sheep, sheep, don't you know the road? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Don't you know the road better, brothers and sisters? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Don't, Don't you know, know the road better, brothers and sisters? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Don't you know the road by the summons of the herdsmen? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Don't, Don't you know the road by the summons of the herdsmen? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Sheep, sheep, don't you know the road? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Sheep, sheep, don't you know the road? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Don't you know the road by the green and the meadow? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Don't, don't you know the road by the green and the meadow? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Don't you know the road by the narrow of the byway? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Don't you know the road by the narrowing of the byway? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Sheep, sheep, don't you know the road? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Sheep, sheep, don't you know the road? Yes, Lord, I know the road. 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 I know the narrow road. I know the 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 narrow road. Sheep, sheep, don't you know the road? Yes, Lord, I know the road. Sheep, sheep, don't you know the road? Yes, Lord, I know the road. When I can lead my title clear to mansions in the skies, I'll bid farewell to every fear and wipe my weeping eyes and wipe my weeping eyes and wipe my. I'll be farewell to every fear and wipe my weeping eyes. And should earth against my soul engage and fiery darts be hurled then I can smile at Satan's rage and face the frowning world and face the frowning world and face the frowning world then I can smile And face a frowning world 